We got a special uh, Miss Erin Huckey. Um, she's going to be bringing the word tonight, so you better be sitting up straight and tall, hands in your laps. Now, she's uh, she's a teacher. Come on, Erin. She's a teacher. Uh, she's been a teacher in youth, but she just she loves. She's a teacher. She teaches the word. Every time we get to hear her speak, it just it's taught in such a way that even a young kid could like me could hear and and take something away. So we're just honored to have you. Um, so te- teach us away. All right. Oh, I hope you're not disappointed tonight <laughs> because as I, when I get together a message or whatever, when I'm told that I'm speaking, whether it's in kids or what, I, I, I try to polish it. I think from beginning to end, I try to add everything in that I'm going to add in, whether it's an illustration or a, whatever it is. And to be honest, I almost completely changed directions on this one because it was not polishing. Like there was no polishing to it. It was just the word and it was very strong that that, I felt like that was what I was supposed to teach, but there wasn't a, there just, it just may come out not polished tonight. So I'm asking you to get in your spirit and listen for what the Holy Spirit is wanting to tell you tonight. I feel like there's, even if it's just a blip out of it, there's something that the Holy Spirit's going to use to change you and to help you grow. And um, I really believe that there's, it's going to change. Like there, like there's, I I believe there's people in here tonight that have come that said something's got to change. You don't have to raise your hand. Um, But I know that there are people in here that said something's got to change. And I, I believe tonight, if you'll listen and don't, don't judge the unpolishing of the word and just listen for the word. I believe that the Holy Spirit's going to speak through me somehow, even if it's not polished. Okay. All right. So I leaned over to Rodney while I go and I said, pastor, just preach my whole message. Let's go home. Hurry quick. Um, and kind of from Sunday too, when we got home, Rodney goes, so I kind of went along with what you're doing on Wednesday. And I said, yep, it kind of did. And then tonight it really, really did. So that was confirmation to me that I'm glad I didn't switch midstream just because it wasn't do what just because it wasn't super polished. Yeah. So um, coming off the heels of Easter, I've been thinking a lot about um, why we celebrate Easter. And it's not necessarily exactly what we're going to talk about tonight, but I want to go just back, back to when the Israelites, back pre-Jesus, back to when, um, really even to when sin entered the world. We know when sin entered, it did what? It separated us. It separated us from the very person that created us, that we're supposed to have a relationship with us, the one that's supposed to sustain us. It completely separated that. And as much as it broke our hearts, I know it broke God's heart because he had fellowship with all of us and then suddenly he didn't. And so he created a temporary way. And those of you that study the Bible, you know that he created a temporary way for people to be able to get their sins covered. It wasn't necessarily a remission or a washing away of the sins, but it was covered. It was enough to where they felt a little bit better and could go on. Otherwise, the heaviness, can you imagine the heaviness of just carrying sin around all the time? I cannot fathom that. And so he made a way for them to be able to take that sin and get it covered, get it for kind of forgiven. Does that make sense? And so we know that, that what he, you know, that the wages of sin is what? So something had to die. And so what he made what a way was, was he said, okay, I want you to take the very best that you've got. The very best that you have taken care of all of that year, whether it was a lamb or a goat or whatever it was, he said, I want you to take your very, very best as unblemished, perfect, He said, you're going to take it. And I heard it preached like this, and it really hit home to me. I heard it preached to where they would take their lamb to the priest, and they would lay it on the altar. And they had to look the lamb in the eye knowing what they were about to do to that because of what they had done. And I just thought, wow, that's heavy. You know, I know that's just an animal, but, you know, that was, might have been their prized animal. I don't know. It might have been the family pet. I don't know. But either way, something was dying that didn't deserve it because of something I did or because something they did. And so that was God's way. So they would, they would slaughter that goat or that lamb and that would cover them for another year or so. And every year they had to do this over and over. And thank God that wasn't his ultimate plan. We know what his ultimate plan was. We know his ultimate plan. It was just a, it was just a, foreshadowing. It was just a type of what he was going to do when he sent his son. And it was, this time it wasn't just going to cover us. This time it wasn't just going to, you know, lay a blanket over it and let's just walk around and pretend it's not there. This time it was going to completely remove everything we had ever done. 
I can't even, um, I don't know, that's just beyond my comprehension to know and to think about even the things I've done today, (laughs) you know, much less my entire life, that this, what he did was enough to completely, for whatever I've done in the past, whatever I'm doing now, whatever I will ever do, it was enough. And you know, that's something to jump up about, isn't it? That's something that we could be rejoicing about and we should be jumping up and rejoicing tonight. So let me ask you this. Why aren't we? And I'm going to tell you there's a reason why. And and it's so simplistic, but it's so stinking hard at the same time. Um, As I was studying, I was thinking about, I was, you know, dealing with stuff this week and I was in my feels this week, for lack of a better word. I was a little bit emotional. I was a little bit touchy. I was a little bit angry. I mean, you know, you name it, that's what I was, you know, and there were things going on and I was frustrated and I couldn't fix it no matter how I tried, you know. How many of you ever had those situations in marriage or parenting or whatever it is? Maybe maybe you have, um, maybe you're having a relationship issue with somebody and no matter how hard you try, you can't fix that. Have you ever felt that? Well, that's kind of where I was this week. I was just like, I, and I knew, I knew what it was. I knew what it was all week and I knew what it was I needed to do, but I didn't do it. How many times do we know what we're supposed to do and we don't do it? Isn't that what pastor talked about Sunday a little bit? I think he hit on that. Knowing what you're supposed to do and not doing it. You know, I knew what I needed to do. So I spent, you know, two days in a funk because of not simply obeying God's word. So tonight we're going to obey God's word. And so I want to I want to read this passage real quick. I did not give you guys this, so I'm just going to read this. It's in Galatians 3. Galatians 3, 23 through 27. And it says, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. So not only did back, you know, when they were having to give, bring all the animals and sacrifice the animals, what else was given at that time to Moses? The law. And it was, if you've ever read the law, it was a lot. (laughs) It was something that we would never, no person on this earth was ever going to live up to, was ever going to be able to complete, was ever going to be able to do. It pointed out every one of our shortcomings, and they were not able to do that. And so it says, before, that, before Jesus came, that's what, that's what, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. How many of you know what protective custody is? So when I think of protective custody, I think of jail. I think of, you know, maybe somebody in jail that's being, you know, put in protective custody. They don't really get to participate with everybody else. They're protecting them. They're keeping them safe from all the other people. That's kind of what I think of when I think of protective custody. And that's kind of what the law did for us. It, it, it put us aside kind of out of reach, kind of in protective custody until, until we could be absolved from that. Does that make sense? That's what it's saying here. It says, let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. Thank God that we no longer need the law. We weren't living up to it anyway, were we? You know? Um, Galatians 4, chapter 1, is, I don't, y'all don't have this either. I'm sorry if y'all will just listen to it. It says, think of it. These are just examples. It says, you know, he's trying, Paul is trying to get it across to him because here he's teaching people that all their life, that's all they've done is follow the law. They don't know anything else than follow the law. So he has given them example after example of, Okay, you didn't get that one. Well, think of it this way. So he gives them an, another example, and it says, if a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of the world. But, everybody say, but. But. I love this. It says, but when the time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. He sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. Isn't that good? He bought our freedom. Everybody say, I am free. 
I am free to not. But we don't always live free. And you want to know why? Because of something called the flesh. And we're going to talk a little bit about the flesh tonight. We do not, you know, I, I, I was going to start off saying we're going to talk a little bit about fighting tonight. We're going to talk a lot about fighting tonight, actually. Different forms of fighting. But it, funny, my grandson the other day, he put his fist up to his mom and he said, you want some of this? <laughs> She called me. She goes, you're not going to believe what Drew just said. And I said, oh, he's ready to fight. But we're going to fight tonight a little bit. And, you know, sometimes, raise your hand if you ever get tired. Have you ever said, I'm tired of fighting? Have you ever thought it if you haven't said it? I've said it, unfortunately. I'm tired of fighting. I'm just going to lay. I mean, literally, if you could see me in the spirit, I am I'm sometimes just laid out somewhere What do you think the devil's doing when you are laid out in the spirit somewhere because you are tired of fighting? Do you think he goes, oh, Aaron, you're tired of fighting? Okay, I'll leave you alone because you're not doing anything. No, he is not. He's going to walk all over me while I'm laying on the ground doing nothing. He doesn't care if I'm not doing anything. He's still going to fight me. And if I give up, I don't have an option but to fight. You don't have an option but to fight. And so we're going to learn how to how to continue to fight, how to not grow weary, and how to continue to fight for the things that belong to us, which is that freedom. And so let's, let's go ahead. I want to turn to Galatians uh, chapter 5 and verse 1. And I think I do have that. Yeah. All right. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Okay, so Christ did the work, right? He set us free. But what the very next thing says now, make sure that you stay free. He doesn't say, now God's going to work to keep you free. He said, there's something we have to do. He said, make sure you stay free. So that tells me, it doesn't tell me, it's not saying meaning salvation. doesn't mean I can lose my salvation. That's not what it means. It means I can walk in less than what the salvation bought for me, though that I can walk in bondage and be tied up. Rodney, go ahead and come up here real quick. Um, So I started not to tell you this because, but the second one was good and we checked it this time because the first one, I don't know if we got a director's cut or what, but it had words in it. But the second one was not that bad. Um, The the Creed movies, has anybody watched any of the boxing movies? It's just about, how many of you watched Rocky? Okay, the Rocky movies. Here, I didn't have boxing gloves, so I'm using my Hulk gloves tonight, okay? Okay. so we, we watched the second creed the other day. And so I was, I was thinking about when I read the scripture, it says, and don't get tied up again in slavery. So while he was boxing, they're yelling, you know, all the people, how many of you have ever been to a boxing match? I have it. So I'm going to look real stupid talking about it tonight for those of you, but I'm going to try to explain what I was watching. So, you know, all the people are standing around the trainer and all of the crowd and everything. And they're yelling, time up, time up. You know, and I'm like, what does that mean? What are they talking about? And so I looked up what tie him up means, and it means to it means clinch. I don't know why it means that. I don't know. But that's a boxing term. It means to clinch, which means if if I'm fighting and we're fighting and I'm making some headway on him, which I usually do, y'all. Anyway, so and I'm no matter how we're fighting and I'm making headway on him. In order for him to stop me, one of the techniques boxers use is they'll use the clinch. So I'm fighting, and so he'll you're not fighting. You're going to clinch me. So you're going to he'll grab he grabs me around and he'll stop me for a second. Have you ever seen boxers do that? I'm like, why do they do that? That is annoying. And they push each other off like that, like get off of me. They tie up. One of the reasons is so they can catch the breath. The second reason is this, and I found this very interesting. It says, wow, I skipped a whole lot. Oh, well, we'll go with it. Um, It says the clinch first and foremost is used as a strategic maneuver. Most boxers use the clinch to tie up an aggressive opponent, making it more difficult for their foes to go on the offensive. So, you know, that's the devil's plan. That's the devil's ploy. And anytime we succumb to operating in our flesh, we, we, we are allowing him to tie us up. So if you feel tied up to that, how many of you feel, you don't have to raise your hand, but... I'd say probably everybody here in some area in your life maybe feels a little bit tied up, maybe feels like that blessing isn't coming. I've believed for that. I've stood in faith for that. I don't know how to forgive that person. I don't know how to let that go, whatever it is. I'm having trouble with my kids. I don't know how to parent this. I don't, me and my husband always fight, whatever it is. And you're, and you're feeling that tied up. It's, it's because the devil, it's because you were aggressive 
Because you, at one point, you were going strong in your spirit, right? And he saw that. And so his goal is to tie you up and to stop you. And to stop you from going. And he'll hold you there as long as you let him. You know, some boxers will do it a little bit because they need the break. But most of the time, they'll push each other off. But that, but that doesn't stop. I, if you watch them, they'll continue. If I continued to make headway on him... <laughs> If I continued to make headway, he would tie me up and tie me up and tie me up again. And you know what? I've noticed that when they get tied up a lot, they start wearing down a little bit. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. Thank you. I don't need you anymore. Yeah, I don't want some of that. (laughs) It's frustrating to be tied up, isn't it? And we have a choice in that. We have a choice whether or not we allow ourselves to be tied up. I'm going to go back and make sure that there's nothing I was... um, Yes, so in, the, in Galatians 5.1, if you'll put that back up there for just a second, the second thing says make sure that you stay free. You know, there are two ways that you have to do that. You have to maintain your freedom and you have to defend it, don't you? You know, when we, um, when we lived in Oklahoma City, it was the only time we had ever bought a house and built a house, I would say. We built it and furnished it and everything. So when we moved in, it was brand spanking new. Anybody ever had the joy of doing that? It's so nice. Or even a new house to you when you move in and maybe you've had a cleaning crew come in and the carpet, you know, the carpet has lines that will never again have lines that look like that, you know, but they're perfect and you don't even want to walk on it. Love that. How long do y'all think a family of five lived there before it did not look that like that anymore? Any guesses? Yeah, not even to move-in day, because move-in day was in August, and it was humid and nasty and raining, and so everybody was traipsing across my carpet with their nasty, muddy feet, and I was so thankful they were helping, but I was so frustrated that my carpet that looked so pretty was getting messed up. But you know what? When they left, what I did? I didn't sit and go, my carpet got messed up, Mm," and just sat there and looked at it. No, got the vacuum cleaner out, went over, tried to replicate the lines, I gave up on that, but at least it was clean. I maintained it. And then when we noticed that our fence that was in the backyard, the wood was, um, you know, we noticed around the neighborhood that a lot of the fences were looking cruddy, and this is a brand new um, you know, a neighborhood, and the fences were starting to get wear on them. We, we were like, oh, we don't want our fence to look that like that. What do we need to do? So we researched. We need to go in, and we need to weather it. We need to stain it. We need to cover it so that it doesn't. So we spent all day doing that. It didn't look great, but you know what? It still looks great. I mean, still, there's, there's no weather, you know, n- nothing's wrong with it now. We maintain that. Um, right after we moved in, there was an outlet that didn't work. We didn't just go, oh, well, the outlet doesn't work. No, we called because we had a warranty and we were like, oh, we need somebody to come out and fix the outlet. We maintained it because it meant something to us. Your freedom should mean something to you. And you should fight for it and maintain it daily. You're, I, no, I'm not going to say you should. You have to. If you're going to, if you're going to, obtain it and keep it. You have to fight for your freedom daily. And so um, maintain it and fight for it. Defend it is the, is the next one. And defend means to act to take action to protect something. Um, you know, in this, I was talking about the Creed movie. In the second one, you know, he's the heavyweight champion of the world. And it goes right along with the Rocky movies. This guy comes in and and he's all that, you know, the creed's all that. And he's like, I can't be defeated, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he goes in and gets his booty kicked, you know, the first time. And he's like, what? What happened, you know? Um, so then they're like, they're calling it, you know, he, he didn't, it wasn't a scheduled fight. So he didn't lose his heavyweight champion of the world title. So he had to defend it. The guy called him out on it and said, I want another fight because I think he got disqualified or something for some punch. And he said, I want another fight. And he, and he had to decide if he was going to defend his title. And so that's, that's what defending means. It means you own something. It was, a, it was bought with such a precious gift, but it's yours now. And what you do with it, that's up to you. How, how much you want to partake of all that he bought for you is up to you. How much you want to walk in freedom in, in every area of your life, that's up to you. And that's up to me, isn't it? So if, if I don't want to have a cruddy week like I had, that's up to me to decide I'm not going to walk in my flesh. I'm not going to be dominated by my flesh, but I'm going to get over into the spirit. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. All right, let's move on. All right, so let's look at some of the works of the flesh. Um, So there are some things that we fail at a lot, me 
I've listed the things I fail at. Y'all want to hear a list of that? Uh, Loving people, forgiving people, wholesome talk, wholesome thoughts, parenting, marriage. I don't know. That's not an exhaustive list, but there's a lot of things I fail at when I'm operating according to what I can do. If I'm parenting my kids according to what I can do in my flesh and I don't involve the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that Hester was talking about tonight, where we, we come to Him and thank Him and ask Him for that help. You know, all, I, I was struggling with an issue with a child this week, and all I had to do was come to Him and ask Him. He knew the answer. He knew what the answer was. He had it the whole time. But instead, I threw a hissy fit alienated another child, made that child mad, got mad, really cruddy week for my husband probably because he had to listen to all of it because I was operating in my flesh and I was frustrated because it wasn't working. I couldn't fix it. I couldn't make it right. And I knew what to do and am doing it. <laughs> um, so let's turn to Galatians 5 verse 13. And I'm going to read all the way to 21 on this one. Actually, no, I'm going to read through 15. It says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. And so... Up here at the first, it says, don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. That's your flesh. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute, of what's your flesh. But I love verse 14 and 15. It says the whole law, if you wanted to really do the whole law, the whole law could be summed up in what? Loving your neighbor as yourself. And you're going to see here when we talk about the things of the flesh, that the majority of them have to do with other people. They have to do with relation. It's, they're very relational. Um, And verse 15 says, but if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So who is your neighbor? Who are the brethren? You guys. How many of you, don't raise your hands, but how many of you have bitten and possibly devoured somebody in the brethren? Maybe not to their face. Maybe you did to their face. We've all done stuff, right? Maybe you didn't to their face, but maybe you did it behind their back to your, and maybe you're like, well, I just, it was just to my spouse. That's what he's talking about here. He said, watch out, because you're going to devour one another if you nitpick, if you're nitpicking. You know, one of the things I was thinking about when I was, you know, Rodney goes, you know why you're dealing with this this week, because you're teaching on it. And I said, I know. And you know what I was thinking when I was praying about it and driving to church tonight? I was thinking about our pastors, and I was thinking about, you know, I just do this once a year, twice a year. They do this every Sunday and every Wednesday, and I'm thinking... I'm sitting here going, you know, I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with this because I'm teaching on it. What does the Bible tell us we're supposed to do for our pastors? Bite and devour them, tear them down, and go, oh, that was a really, that just wasn't a good service this morning. Or I can't believe they said that, or I can't believe they're doing that. You better believe that's biting and devouring. And, and one of the things that he was ministering to me is I don't pray near enough for them. That's, that's one thing he ministered to me on the way up here was I don't pray near enough for them because if I'm experiencing a little bit of pushback from the devil because I'm getting up here and delivering God's word, can you imagine what they're, what they're experiencing? I don't know. I can't talk for them, but I'm imagining they're probably experiencing quite a bit of mm, resistance. Resistance, because every time they get in the pulpit, lives change. Every time, and the devil takes notice to that. You better believe he does. And I'm not saying oh my gosh, let's fall on our knees because they are under attack. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the devil, there is opposition. There is opposition against them and we should be praying for them daily. Did you know there's opposition against each other? Your neighbors that are sitting there, maybe the one that didn't smile at you when you walked in tonight that you've been "Mm," ever since you got here or the one that got to do something that you didn't get to do and you've been, "Mm." Did you know there's opposition against them? We're not to bite and devour each other. We're to encourage and uplift each other to continue running our race and fighting because he, you are not my enemy. You will never be my enemy. And it's only when I get over into the flesh and the works of the flesh are operating in me that I think that you're, I begin to think you're my enemy. 
And I don't want, I don't want you to be my enemy. I don't, I don't even want to look at, at any of you like that. And so let's look at Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And this is in the Passion Translation because I loved how this read. I've been reading out of NLT, the other, but... Um, let's just read some of the works of the flesh. It says, the behavior of the self-life is obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions. I love that one. I didn't love it, but I went, oh. Because I like my opinion, because my opinion's right, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's ugly. God had to, God just throws all those little ones in there. It's kind of like when he threw in honor your parents in there with, you know, the sins or, you know, the, the things. And you're like, that's odd that that's in there with like murder. And I don't know what all, you know, and he throws that in there. He thinks of things like that. He doesn't want you thinking your opinion's all that in a bag of chips. I read that today. I was like, date yourself in the 80s when you say that. Anyway. Uh, being envious of the blessings of others. There's your one. There's one. Oh, they're going to Florida. Wish I could go to Florida. Anybody ever said that besides me? Being envious of the blessings of others. Murder. <laughs> Murder's right next to being envious of the blessings of others. God. God. Uncontrolled addictions. Wild parties and all other similar behavior. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom of the, the kingdom of God? It doesn't mean you're not going to be saved. You know, I used to read that going, I'm not going to go to heaven if I have a wild party. No, that's not what that means. That means I am not going to inherit everything that what he did for me, I'm not going to inherit that. I'm not going to be walking in that. I'm not going to be participating in that because I can't participate in my flesh and my spirit at the same time. I have to choose which, which fruit do I want? Do I want this fruit in my life? Do I want to be envious of you, Jennifer? Do I want to kill you, Mona? Sometimes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Never. Never. Do I want to throw a temper tantrum? Do I only want to think of myself? Do I want to be in love with my own opinions? Or do I want what comes up in the next verses. And he talks about the spirit. And I talk, let me go back to this. I, I mentioned that a lot of those, if you'll notice, probably two thirds of those have to do with relational things. A lot, you know, some of it's personal, like the first few were sexual immorality, although that's pretty relational. I don't know. You know, got to do that with somebody else. But uh, lustful thoughts, that's personal. Pornography, personal. Chasing after things instead of God. But then you get into things manipulating others. Hatred of those who get in your way. Senseless arguments. So a lot of those are relational. And so God is a very relational person. So your relationships between each other matter so very much. You know, I, th I don't remember, maybe, I don't know if pastor said this or the Holy Spirit said it to me. I don't know. I think pastor's been talking about it. If you, if you have something, you know, make things right between people, make it, make it right. I don't know. Maybe not. Don't quote me on that. Somebody said it. It's good though. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be sitting in here and have, you shouldn't be able to walk past somebody at church or avoid people. Have you ever gone to Walmart and you've avoided people? I do that. And it's not because I don't like you. It's because I don't want to talk. That's rude, isn't it? It's because I'm awkward and I go, and I walk up and go, uh, what do I say? I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say, you know? And so there's times I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know what to say to them. So I avoid them. I'm working on it. I know I have issues. Okay. But you know, we do that in church and a lot of times we do it or, you know, around our friends. It's hot in here. Y'all hot? I'm never hot in here. Uh, we do that around our friends. We do that around in, to people in here. Maybe you see somebody on the other side of the church and you kind of walk the other direction because not because anything bad's happened, but there is, eh. have you ever had that? Eh. There's something in there. Well, I don't know if they like me. They didn't talk to me last time. And there's just that and it, and it starts to build. The devil's so good at his job, you know? We all should be like my middle daughter was. She'd just walk up and go, hi, y'all. She just thought she was, you know, in with everybody. I will never forget. Well, she was maybe, how old, Rodney, two or three? And that was when pastors were the youth pastors over here. And we pulled up. It was an empty parking lot. And Pastor Nate was, we pulled up down here. She's clear. He's clear down here by the sign working on something. She gets out of the car and she's like, hi, Pastor Nate. And she had this little hick voice. And he just turns and looks to see who this little three-year-old is that's hollering at him. She didn't care who you were. 
She still doesn't. She thinks she's in with everybody. You know what? It would, it would be good if we just kind of took on that and we just thought, we're in with everybody. I, everybody in here likes me. Everybody in here loves me. And so then it's just so easy to walk in right a right heart with, with somebody instead of just letting the devil talk in your ear. Well, Jenna might not like you, so you better not go up and talk to her. They're not, you're not in that crowd. You're, you're not good enough to talk with them. The devil says stuff like that all the time. He stinks. I hate him. <laughs> anyway, I do. Um, okay, so let's talk about the spirit real quick in, my, in the last few minutes because that's the most important thing. So we know that walk, to, to get out of our flesh, we have to get over to the spirit. And you know, this. I love that he started tonight with praying in the spirit because I've been doing a lot of that while I've been studying with this. The Holy Spirit's directed me. I love how when I get in God's word and and, he, and I begin to study it out because when you're going to talk up here, you get in God's word and you study a lot. And so I love how when I do that, he begins to minister exactly everything that I need. And he begins to work on me before I ever even get up here in this area. And so all week long, I've just had an unction to pray in the spirit, wherever, I mean, at work, wherever on the way to just a lot. And you know, I love what he said tonight that I w- I'm asking God for help. I'm thanking him. I'm thanking the Holy Spirit for his help. That is how we get out of our flesh and into the spirit is we rely on the spirit. We rely on the Holy Spirit and we thank him for it. And so let's look at Galatians 5 verse uh, verse 16. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. There it is. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, and you're not going to fall into any of those traps. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you operate according to the Spirit, you're not under the law anymore. You don't have to follow all of those regs. Why don't you? You know, I used to hear people say, well, don't teach that grace stuff because it just gives people a license to sin. Not if you're, not if you're doing it right. <laughs> because if you're, if you're truly saved by grace and you know it and you're operating according to the Spirit, there is a desire there to want to please. There is a desire there to want to do the things God's asked you to do. I'm not saying we're not going to slip up and make mistakes because you are going to venture over into your flesh and you're, it's a constant battle. Paul says it here. I mean, he says, I mean, I don't know the scripture, but I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the, you know, he's just talking about the battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit. All right. So let's read the fruits of the spirit. We all know these, and these are awesome. It says, but the Holy Spirit, so when we operate in the Holy Spirit, it produces the kind of fruit, this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. I love that. So when we operate according to the Holy Spirit, when we just, when we just yield to him, this week I could have yielded so easily. My spirit wanted to, but for some reason, my flesh felt like I had to figure it out. And I worked myself into a frenzy before I knew it. When my spirit was just longing for me to get over and say, what do you say, God? What do you say about my daughter? What do you say about her? What, what should I do? What shouldn't I do? Should I say something? Should I not say something? He knows. But when I'm over in my flesh, I'm over going, I got to do this. I got to say that. I got to send this text. I got to do this. I got to, I got to, I got to. And then I'm walking in frustration and I'm walking in, uh, and I'm walking in all the works of the spirit because I am operating completely without him in that area. But if I would have just yielded and said, okay, Holy Spirit, I can't do this. Just like what we did tonight. What'd we do? We put our hands up in there and said, it's all yours. I've worked and I've worked and I've worked. I'm not saying you're not going to have to work. (laughs) I'm not saying, you know, if you're something, something needs to be built, you're not going to have to work. I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. When you've strived to fix something and you've strived and you've strived and you've strived and it's just not working. You've strived to make ends meet and there's nothing there. 
You've strived to heal that part of your body. You've done everything you know to do. You've drunk the right stuff, taken the right medicine. You've done everything you know to do, and it still hasn't come. You've strived to repair that relationship, and it's just caused more, more ter- turmoil. That's what I'm talking about. When we do, when we do, and we do, it comes a time where it, it, the best thing you can do is to take your hands off and just say, Holy Spirit, you know. You know the direction I need to go in this relationship. You know the words I need to speak to my daughter. You know. And so I am yielding to you right now. I'm yielding my spirit to you. I am putting my flesh under. I am engaging in the fight. I am not laying down. And I will not, I will not yield to you flesh. Because it is a matter of life and death sometimes. It really is, y'all. And so how, how do I operate consistently in the spirit? And we're going to close with this. It's just three points. This was super, super fast tonight, but this is what God told me to speak. So there is. So how do I operate consistently in the spirit? Number one is relationship. You can't operate in the spirit if you don't have a relationship with him. And, you know, I could ask everybody in here, if you're saved, raise your hand. And I would venture to say, if you're here, most, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say everybody is, but I would venture to say we are. But salvation is good, but it's not necessarily a relationship. You know, the, my wedding was good with my husband, but it's, it's not a relationship. I've had to work for how long? How long we've been married? I always have to ask him this, 26, 27 years. I've had to work for 27 years on that relationship. Did you know you have to work on your relationship with God? In order for you to be so close to him that you're willing to, that he can bend your ear when you're in a, in a twist, in order for you to be close, in order for him to bend your ear, you have to be close to him. There has to be a relationship there. There also has to be a trust there. You have to know that what he's saying is right. You have to know that. And that comes with relationship. It says, let me read this. It says, the Christian life is not about legalism or following rules. It is driven by our commitment to and relationship with God. We follow his will, not because we are scrambling to earn our, our salvation, but because we love him and want to honor him. That's become the center of our new life. You know, pastor said on Sunday, I don't remember exactly what he was, oh yeah, I do. He said, it's good to be honest with ourselves. He said, if I would rather be somewhere else than church, I I shouldn't say I can't be there. I say, I won't be there. I won't be there. Or I choose to be somewhere else. You know, um, let's do that with our relationship. If you don't have a relationship close enough to God, if you feel like you're in your flesh all the time and your relationship is not close, let's call it what it is. Let's be honest. Say, don't say, well, you know, I, I've got all this going on. I'm too busy. I've got this. Uh, you know, when I get home, I've got kids. Call it what it is. I'd rather be doing something else than spending time with you, God. Yeah. Oh, the hurt. I'd rather, be, I'd rather be somewhere else on a Wednesday night than here. I'd rather be, um, I'd rather sleep in than to get up five minutes early and talk to you a little bit. I'd rather listen to my car. I'd rather listen to my radio than talk to you on the way to work. It's just the little things. You know, if I did that to my husband, the way I treat God sometimes, we probably wouldn't be married. If I got in the car every time we got in, turned the radio on full blast, even though he's trying to talk to me and just completely ignored him, you know, um, got to work or got home, just, you know, cooked dinner, did whatever I wanted to, sit down and watch TV, never, never engaged him, never even acknowledged he was there. Our relationship would be non-existent. But yet we do that with God a lot, and we don't even realize we're doing it. I know I do. And my relationship with him, that's number one key for me to consistently stay in the spirit is to spend time with him, be in that constant relationship with him so that, so that I, my spirit is dominating, you know? Number two is it's all about what you feed. Uh, I want to read this story. I know you guys have heard this. It's just a little paragraph. It says, once an old man and his grandson were walking through the woods when the grandfather turned to the young man and said, young one, inside all of us, there is a battle raging between two wolves. You have felt it even in your young years, and I have felt it all my life. One of the wolves is evil. He is anger, envy, greed, regret, arrogance, resentment, lies, hatred, and ego. 
The other one is good. He is love, joy, peace, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, generosity, compassion, truth, and faith. Everyone has this battle going on inside them. It says they walked a little further in sil- silence until the lo- young boy stopped and asked, Grandfather, which wolf will win? And the wise old man, man simply replied, the one you feed. It's, it really is. It's the one we feed the most. Are we feeding our flesh? Am I feeding the, my flesh when I come in here? Or am I feeding my spirit? Sometimes it's as simple as pastor says, raise your hands. I don't want to raise my hands. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, and I'm training my 14-year-old. I'll kind of, you'll see me give him a little punch on the side. When somebody up here says, raise your hands, and his hands are still down by his side, I'll give him, and he, his hands go up. It's a training it's training to yield. It's tra- I'm training him to yield to the Spirit. The Spirit is directing somebody up here, is directing us through our pastor or whatever up here. And when we don't yield, it's small things like that, y'all. Train yourself to yield, even on small things like that, because if you will yield on things like that, you're going to yield on the big things. But don't ever expect to yield when those big decisions come. If the pastor stands up here and says, y'all raise your hands, and you go, yeah, I don't want to. You're not going to yield when the big things come. And that's just an example. It's just the first thing that came to my mind. But it could be a lot of things. Uh, The last one, and I love this. And, you know, because I talked about the the works of the flesh and how a lot of them were relational. Um, Operating consistently in the spirit, you can do that when you're serving other people. When you're serving, and, and the main reason is, and I know God set it up like this, the main reason is when you're serving someone else, when you're preferring someone over yourself, you're not operating in your flesh. Because tell me that the devil does that. Does he prefer other people over himself? No, goodness. He wanted to be God. He wasn't even happy being the, the amazing creature that God created him. That wasn't good enough. He, he didn't prefer even God over himself. And so that is not the devil's nature to serve and prefer somebody over ourselves. But when we begin to look at each other with the eyes of God, and that's something I've been praying that God would use me because would work in me more is seeing people the way God sees them, not being frustrated because they don't do what I would do or say what I would say or act the way I would act. And so I just get frustrated and I get irritated. And, and before long, I'm over clear over into my flesh. I want God to work on that. Well, one of the ways is when I begin to serve them, if, if your husband's aggravating you, serve him. I assure you, as you serve him, you will not continue to be aggravated with him. You can't. And as we begin to put people on the pedestal that God actually has them on, because we're the only, we're the only things that God gave his only son for, we're a pretty big deal. Aren't we? You're a pretty big deal. And if I'm biting at Sheena and I'm picking at her and I'm, and I'm criticizing her and even not to her face, but sometimes even just in our thoughts, that is a flash and that is a signal. That is a warning sign. Ding, ding, ding. Something's off. Get it back in, get it back in check. And so I go to her and, I, you know, if it's really ought in my heart and I'm, I, then I go to her and talk to her. But if it's a just, well, I don't know why I feel that way, then you know what? I'm going to serve her. I'm going to prefer her. I'm going to find out what matters to her and I'm going to lift her up in prayer. I'm going to do something special for her. I might sacrifice. I'm, I'm not going to do this, but I love you anyway. I might sacrifice my vacation for her and give her a vacation. I, my heart is to do that. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to do stuff like that. I want to be able to prefer. I want, I want to be able to prefer somebody so much that I'm willing to give up something, anything. And I know that's a big thing, but it could be anything. So putting others first. So the three things, you got to have relationship with God if you want to operate consistently in the spirit. You have to feed the right part of you and you have to begin to serve others. It says, um, Galatians 5, 13 and 14 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. 
I love how he just includes that in there right there. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. I don't like getting bit. Do you like getting bit? Do you like ugly words said about you? Do you like being left out? Do you like being ignored? Do you like being talked about? Do you like being criticized? I hate it. You know how many times I do that to people? More than I should. More than I'd even hate to admit to y'all. And my prayer is that as those thoughts begin, because the devil's real good about planting thoughts. You know why? Because he doesn't like us being a group. We are a team, (laughs) y'all. We are a team in here. Every person that walks in this building, you're on my team. And there's nothing worse. I watched a team last year. This was a high school basketball team. And they did nothing all year long besides pick on each other. It was awful. In practice, not, not you know, play, playing around. But I'm talking, I don't like that you're scoring more points than me picking on. I don't like that you're doing better than me. I don't like that you got the promotion. I don't like that you... And they just, they fought and bickered all year. And you know how, much, how many games they won? Not very many. If we as Beyond Church want to win some games, if we want to go where God wants us to go, I cannot be aggravated with Emily. I, I can't even let that enter my mind. And I don't know why I'm harping so big on this tonight, because that wasn't even really in my notes, but I just, maybe I need to hear it. I don't know. I can't be sideways with Becky. I can't be aggravated because it wasn't the breakfast I wanted. That free breakfast wasn't the breakfast I wanted, you know. I can't be sideways with these people. And above all, I can't be at aught with the people that are standing up here on stage delivering the word of God to me because that will shut you down from hearing from them. So right now, tonight, if anybody in here has any ought with pastor, my challenge is, you, is to you is to get in a line tonight and talk with him about it. I don't care how long it is. <laughs> He's here all night. He's here for you. He wants to hear from you. I'm kidding. But that is what the Bible says. That is what the Bible says. It's not easy, is it? If you have ought in your heart with somebody, go to that person and make it right. And the last person that we need to be at aught with is our pastors that are feeding us. Can you imagine a sheep being irritated with its shepherd and running from? Because, you know, when a sheep, when you're irritated with somebody, you distance. You're not going to receive what God has for you. And as a body, if we distance ourselves from each other and bite and devour and bite each other, it says, be careful. We will start devouring one another. I don't want to be responsible for devouring any of you in here. You are precious to God. You are on my team. We need to win. And every one of us have a part to play. The last thing we need to do is to be picking people apart, right? Anyway, so I love you guys. And I know that was like, "Ah." but it is totally God. You know, when God leads me to, I I told Rodney, and this is how it's worked almost every time when I get a message, I get a general idea and then I start putting my illustrations in. Then I start putting the word in. I know the word I'm going to, this was complete opposite. It was stay in Galatians, don't leave it. And I can't tell you how many times I read it over and over. And I'm like, but you're not giving me anything to fill it in. He's like, I got it. I got it. I got, I got you. Anyway. Anyway, God's got you tonight, right? All right, love you guys.